Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am here with two fantastic guests with similar kind of parallel um, experiences in their practices. And um, I'm just really excited to have them on the show today. So first, welcome Dr. Amber Brown. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Yay. And Dr. Juan Michelle Martin. Hey, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good because I'm happy that you guys are here. Yay. So before I get started, I want to um, brag on you guys just a little bit. So hang with me because I love to go over your bios. I think that also gives um, our listener just some insight into A, just how much work goes into doing what you do um, and your level of education and experience. And of course, before the show ends, they'll also know where to find you too. So starting out with uh, Dr. Amber Brown. Dr. Brown is dedicated to women's health and also financial wellness. And I love that combo because I yes. don't think that we can have one <laughs> without the other. Exactly. Um, and there's some some kind of deep roots in that. I think that hopefully we'll we'll uncover, you know, as we um, as we talk. But um, Dr. Brown founded Root Physical Therapy and Wellness. She is a doctor of physical therapy with a lot of experience in pelvic floor dysfunction and maternal health. But here's my favorite part. Um, she also is, in addition to being board certified in, in women's uh, health clinical specialist, she's a birth doula, which I just love. And there's so much work that goes into that. So um, I'm doula's biggest fan. She is also a certified lymphedema therapist. And as someone with lymphedema, I say, oh my goodness, thank goodness yes. that you exist. Um, you're also a health coach and a yoga teacher. And um, my first book was on therapeutic yoga. So hats off to you doing all those things is fantastic. She contributes in academia as well through guest lectures, through being a faculty member at the University of St. Augustine. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Pelvic PT Doulas and she combines pelvic health with compassionate doula care. Her mission is to promote a balanced approach to health care and wellness, emphasizing the avoidance of burnout while pursuing a fulfilling career, which is an enigma for many of us, particularly women in healthcare and women in physical therapy, because there's just so many, there's so much pressure on us. And in her spare time, she's working on her PhD at Texas <laughs> Women's University. Well, this in her spare time. <laughs> That's right. Hey, I still travel and sleep and, you know, enjoy eating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Let's talk about Dr. J next. She is also a doctor of physical therapy with 16 years of experience specializing in orthopedics and pelvic PT which is of course, I'm a little biased, but that's my favorite thing too. <laughs> she is also a birth and postpartum doula and a certified sex counselor. And we definitely need more of both of those mm -hmm. in the world. For sure. Yeah. She is the owner of JMM Health Solutions in the Metro Atlanta area focused on pelvic health. She is an adjunct professor within the DPT program at South College in Atlanta and an instructor within the obstetrics courses for Academy of Pelvic Health. She is an evidence-based birth instructor, an educator, and she is also an author because she has spare time too, apparently. Um, and those have been international pelvic and sexual health uh, uh, publications, texts, um, and in that kind of industry and vein. Um, she's a curator of Zero to Telehealth Coaching Program which I want to know more about, um, which helps a lot of professionals implement telehealth in their practices, which we were all kind of dumped into doing three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, she shares her expertise in many domains. The American PT Association is one of those. Um, she served as a member of the Southeastern Telehealth Resource Center since 2019 and has just been helping medical and allied healthcare professionals um, within that region and beyond. So welcome. Welcome to you both. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So the first thing, this is my first question right out of the gate, because um, when I had my first, who will be 18 in December, which that 18 years is just like fast, it's gone. <laughs> 
Um, the concept of a doula was, was around, obviously, but I lived in an isolated area. There was, there was no doula in the Tri-County area. Like there wasn't enough of them. They, were, they weren't easy to find. It was hard enough for me to just find a midwife. That actually truly supported perenniums <laughs> and your birth plan, yeah. right? Um, and that's when I started tracking birth outcomes and maternal health outcomes. So that's almost 20 years ago. And as you guys already know, those outcomes are not great and they're mm -hmm. actually getting worse. And I think our listener may not know that, that our, you would think with technology, et cetera, that these birth outcomes would be getting better. They're not. We are in a steady descent and decline actually since the 60s, which is crazy, totally crazy. Mm -hmm. So I totally get why you guys are pelvic PTs and doulas, which I absolutely love. And if I was 20 years younger, I'd probably do the same thing. And, uh, but I feel like, you know, you feel like you run out of time at some, at a certain point, but um, what motivated you to actually combine being a pelvic PT and then go get doula training on top of it? Because I think it's just perfect. For me, my patients motivated me. Um, so many people during pregnancy, when I was doing birth prep, which mind you, we could talk about it more. My birth prep now looks totally different than what it did before I was birth doula. But when I was um, going through birth prep sessions with my clients, they're like, can't you be by my side? And I don't have kiddos. I'm like, no, I don't know what goes on around, you know, like in the birth room. That's not me. <laughs> but they're like, your presence, like your knowledge. I need that in that moment of, you know, whenever I'm going through labor and I was like, uh, I don't know. But on the other side, when unfortunately people were just referred to me for postpartum, which of course, these are two different categories of people. They were like, why couldn't you have been by my side? I went through so much and had so much trauma and I wish you were by my side. So after about five, six years of practice and hearing this, uh, of course the pandemic hit. And that's when both of us actually were in the same training. We didn't, we didn't plan it. Oh, wow. um, and that's really when it was born where I was like, oh, well, let me see what this, what I could do about this it has made a world difference. So my patience influenced me. I actually started supporting births even prior to taking the training. I used to work for a hospital and worked in L&D, mother, baby, and the NICU. And the stuff that you would see, the way that I felt, felt some days that it was such a struggle just to even get a nurse to write an order for patients that you knew should have been seen. Yeah. And the, the general consensus was, but they're pregnant or, well, they just had a baby. What do you expect? And it was just really, really defeating at times. And I'm like, the people don't, people don't deserve this. Like we need to do more. And, it, and, and if I'm in the hospital and getting this much, you know, resistance, then my goodness. So I, I decided I had supported the births of some friends. And then I had had other patients ask me, Hey, would you, would you want to be there? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I'll, I'll be there to support you and whatnot. And I started doing that and I wondered, well, how much different, because I was doing it from the perspective of making sure that they were calm, making sure that they were relaxed, making sure that, you know, especially positionally, I had a few of them that were going into birth with musculoskeletal issues, making sure that those things were, were acknowledged and, and they were protected in that way. Um, and so then I was like, well, maybe I should kind of see what, what doulas, what the trainings are like, and some of the other things that they focused on, which like Amber said, really made a world of difference, especially when it came to educating them beforehand um, on some of the other non-clinical things. But I also think me being a foreigner helps a lot because birth culturally looks a lot different outside of the U.S. than it does in the U.S. And unfortunately, even in some foreign countries, they get into a habit of, oh, well, everything in America is great, so we should pattern things after them. But I really wish that a lot of them would not mm -hmm. and would stick to a lot of the cultural practices that they have because it is completely different. Birth and, and immediate postpartum care are things that are definitely missing here. Absolutely. And I'll, 
I'll definitely say even for Jay, if, if, you, if the listener stops and thinks about it, before I had my own private practice, I was a corporate outpatient. And so I was being, you know, re required or waiting. This was before direct access. So I'd wait for referrals and only certain people, if you're lucky enough, depending mm -hmm. on your provider, uh, you would refer to me versus Jay was also in acute, like she was actually on the labor delivery floor. So we were coming with two different perspectives as physical therapists with what we were seeing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is huge. We could unpack that for the next hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> alone and because i've had um <clears throat> rebecca seagraves and Catherine mm -hmm. sylvester um, yes. in Love previous them. weeks yeah i think um i think dr seagraves uh podcast just dropped today mm -hmm. and that's the beginning of a, a huge conversation that um i noticed years and years ago um which then prompted me to pull together a, a group of um, international PTs to start looking at the outcomes on global maternal mortality. And then that led us to be able to present that work at World Congress in 2017, which was in South Africa. And I learned so much from doing that little project um, and being on that platform. And then so much being in that country, appreciating and talking to the therapists from across the world, not just, you know, on the continent, right? Mm -hmm. um, to understand what they were missing, you know, inpatient versus outpatient. We talk about what we're mm -hmm. missing inpatient versus outpatient. And then I was flooded with all of these stories and, and also a lot of gratitude that we're just bringing awareness to this issue that, mm -hmm. Jay, what you were saying about honoring cultural traditions and kind of the social context of what go goes on in other countries, because that, what you said, just hit the nail on the head, um, following, you know, the, the, if you can even call it the culture of what we do in the United States is, is not getting us anywhere. <laughs> we are going backwards. Um, we, we have less support. We have, less cohesive communities we have less we don't have respect. our village we don't right. have a village. We don't have our village don't have a village anymore um and that that is across the lifespan mm -hmm. but it's particularly i think profound during birth when you want to have that community and village of support and that's what's so beautiful about the practice of being a doula is that you're able to provide that village and oh i get upset just just thinking about it um that's such a beautiful thing that you're able to provide to provide that comfort for women, especially if they don't have um, the family, you know, around that to support them too, because in many ways you become a family member mm -hmm. doing we that. Do. We yeah. essentially do. We're at the birthday parties. We're at the family <laughs> events. We have, I mean, I, I, Amber and I could tell you number of all the stories. We're at the second birth and the, you know, whatever the family's got going on sometimes, you know, well, I've got kids too. So sometimes it might be just for a play date, you know, because yeah. you truly do become family. Mm -hmm. You do become a part of their unit. You were there during like one of the most vulnerable moments you know, and you provided the support that they needed. Like I just came back from, I'm, I'm in Dallas area. I just came back from Cleveland because I celebrated the first birthday of a virtual doula uh, client, right? And so they're like, please come out to the birthday. I'm like, I'll be there. So it, you, you definitely develop that bond. And I want people to remember when it comes to birth, there's a difference between like birth doula and postpartum, but I'm, I'm just, I put quotes in that, just a birth doula. But even with that, I'm following people for the first uh, first year postpartum. I'm checking in with them because as we all know, things came up, right? And so they have that person who was with them during pregnancy, during birth. And then also I'm following, making sure, oh, we need to refer here. We need to do this. Um, they just have that year round and beyond support. It's a model that I wish that it was inherently provided let's see by the women and family you know and families decades and decades ago but not not anymore i think today and it's and it's a model that if only we were able to provide that in the context of covered care of a standard of practice of care that we don't currently have um you know in the united states that would be amazing because not everyone has access to 
you know, having a doula. And I'm sure we can talk about that too, you know, having mm -hmm. access and how that looks, you know, as a continuum across, because some people can afford it, some people can't. What does it look like to help people access it who can't uh, afford it? Um, which brings up the topic of being in private pay clinics too. I mean, I own one. I think, Amber, you, yours is- I'm hybrid. You're hybrid. hybrid. Okay. Yes. And Jay, how about you? I'm completely private pay. Completely private pay. Yeah. So um, we're private pay here uh, at my practice as well. And people often, I think there's a misconception about what private pay is because, for example, the reason that I went, went into it is because insurance wasn't paying me anything to work for people with chronic pain. So then I couldn't legally see them because they were insured. I took insurance. Therefore, I can't help them. And when you're offering a specialized service for a particular pelvic health diagnosis, then your hands are tied. Mm -hmm. And so it forced me out of the system. That was back in 2004, uh, when I actually had to write letters <laughs> to get out of insurance contracts. Mm -hmm. It was like pre-internet. So I think that, you know, if you're listening and you're wondering, huh, it's private pay, does it mean I can't access it? Does it mean it's just too expensive to, to um, you know, to access? The answer is, is no, we, you know, we go into this in order to make it accessible, in order to make it affordable so that you can get the care that you need and your hands are not tied by an insurance company saying, oh, you're not allowed to do that. You know, you're not allowed to give them the care they actually deserve and want. And then the other positive thing about um, practicing the way that you do is you get to spend one-on-one, 100% -on -one, of your time attending to their needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a common misconception too, is that oh, I'll go to a big system and I'll get the same level of care that mm -hmm. I would at a private pay uh, you know, clinic. And go ahead, Amber, I know you're gonna say yeah. something. No, 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 <laughs> because again, this is my, my money side coming out, but I'll, I'll limit yeah. that a little bit. <laughs> I think also there's a misconception one, a lot of people don't know what we do as physical therapists. True. And then if their only interaction with physical therapy has been, oh, my grandma had a knee replacement and she had to go three times a week. There's no way I could pay cash price three times a week. The difference is when we're in private practice, one, because again, I, I came from corporate healthcare. <laughs> the difference is our numbers are different. Like we're not under a different system where it's like, oh, you have to meet this quota. I have to see this many people, this many. I got dinged because I was too efficient with my treatment, if that tells you something. Because mm -hmm. we were supposed to see people for 4.6 visits and people were getting better in three visits in corporate and I got dinged for that. So just because you know, you're know you under insurance doesn't always mean that you're going to really get the care you need. Sometimes you're a number. This is not a, by the way, I love my corporate colleagues. It is not their doing. It is the system we are in in healthcare yeah. in the U.S. I always put that out there. Yeah. Um, someone has to do that. And so, unfortunately, because we are under a corporation and you have these numbers and quotas and everything to meet, um, providers get burned out. I had people follow me from corporate to my private practice, and they're like, "Your practice is so different now." I'm like, "Yeah." Because we have that flexibility. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the other thing is, is when you are able to, my evals, for example, I spend an hour and a half with my client. And if I don't have someone booked behind them, I might take a little bit longer just because I have had clients who might've just come in. They're like, listen, I don't know if this is something that I can do consistently because of funds, but I at least would love to, to get evaluated. And I would spend the extra time beyond the hour and a half if I can, um, just so that they get all they need and so that they know that they've been heard. It is really difficult to watch someone come in for something that hasn't been diagnosed when they've been ignored, they've been gaslit, you name it. Mm -hmm. And they have they they are now in a vulnerable state and they're in tears either because of what's going on with their specific concern or because you're the first person to have put all the things together and figured it out. And they're in tears. I'm not rushing you out. I want you to take your time. This is your moment. This is not for me. 
I'm just glad that I get to be on the journey with you, but this is about you. And I think the difference in the way that we work is we are able to do that for individuals, which is, again, as you both said, is not something that we see consistently or much at all in healthcare, traditional healthcare. Yeah. And I also tell patients, don't limit yourself. Many providers uh, have complimentary consultation, if you will, right? Where maybe they meet virtually to see if it's something that they could work with you. You could get the pricing and you, there's a way to budget. Again, I'm not going to get into that, but <laughs> don't limit yourself because we don't want wait people waiting. I often tell people, think about if you had an ankle injury and you waited 18 years until your kids were out the house. Well, we'll say 20, right? So 20 years until your kids were kind of out the house and now you're going to work on your ankle. Think about how much longer it's going to take for that recovery because we develop a new pattern. So I often remind people just lost. Ask for that support that you need and what we can see what we could do to work towards it. We have that flexibility yeah. in the cash world. Absolutely. So that brings up another question because when we are mentioning maternal outcomes declining, there's also another really important factor in that, which is that for women and people of color giving birth, those outcomes are worse, sometimes up to four times worse, meaning for people and women of color giving birth, your risk of dying is up to four times higher. And that's been always been a touchstone for me since I started following birth outcomes, which I started to do when of course, when I was pregnant, I'm like, oh, let's see what the outcomes are like. Let's look up the hospitals around. And I just was like, oh, oh my, that is so not acceptable. Um, seeing C-section you know, rates rise, et cetera. So with that knowledge in hand, so as a listener, now you know like these are what the statistics are saying that our birth outcomes are getting worse. And our patterns for referral, when you think about countries like France, for example, who are gonna have a measure of postpartum pelvic PT covered and we don't, what are some of the things that you guys see in terms of women and, and people being medically gaslit? And here's a classic example, and I hear this one all the time. And Jay, you said you had you like had a good paraphrasing of the story that I hear a lot in practice too is mom comes in the door, sits down, and I say, Oh, how did you find me? Well, it wasn't through a referral. It was through word of mouth of their or their friend, or I actually had a mom whose daughter just gave birth. And this is what she said. I'm so glad my daughter just gave birth. Who knows how much longer I would have waited to address this leakage thing, because I just thought that it was what should happen when I'm in my 60s, right? That's what happens to everybody else. That's what should happen to me. And so that's how she found out. But the classic story I hear is that mom comes in sits down how did you find me it was a friend or a family member or reading online and um she said well i went back for my six week one single six week checkup which is another can of worms to discuss uh to open and i asked for pelvic pt but they said i just had a baby and i don't i don't really need it mm -hmm. so what if you guys heard? What are some of the typical things you heard? Just so our listener gets a feel for what they have a right to in yeah. terms of pelvic PT. Well, I want to plug first that when it comes to the stats, even though according to media outlets and so on, it shows that the maternal mortality for Black Americans is three to five percent. That is actually not across the board. In a lot of metropolitan areas, it is way worse. In the state of New York, research came out, I believe it was 20, around 2019, some, sometime between 2018 and 2020. And the maternal mortality was as high as 12% in New York City. You've got a lot of other metropolitan areas where it creeps up to just that amount. It's it's really bad. The three to 5%, I think, really mask it. And then, then we get into nuances of, you know, society. Well, oh, it's because, you know, Black women may not have childbirth education or Black women are not smart or all these different things. Well, the rate of maternal mortality for college-educated Black women is still 5.2 times higher 
than mm -hmm. let's say a white Caucasian high schooler. So education has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But that being said, when we look at some of the things that we hear, which is really awful, you know, it's, it's the same old, well, you had a baby or you don't need therapy. You just need to give your body time. It wasn't that bad, you know, but you had a vaginal delivery as if, you know, just because someone had a vaginal delivery, it somehow or another erases any particular type of trauma that they might've experienced during that process. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, it was a cesarean. You don't have any, you won't have any issues, any pelvic floor issues with a cesarean. Well, I did the surgery. It was great. Loved yeah. one. I heard that one. Yeah, um, I, you can see all our <laughs> eyes. If you're listening, especially you whenever see all yeah. our eyes getting bigger. Yeah, <laughs> especially I remember when I was um, marketing way back when, and they were like, what, what do you do for C-section? I'm like, well, there's so many things. We might work on the scar. Like, why would there be a scar? I do the Why would there be a scar? I did the surgery. You're right. You're right. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's amazing the the amount of things that you hear, and and again, a lot of it, it just kind of revolves around. Well, you're you're a mother now, and Man. and I'm like, and what what's that supposed to mean? You know. And so for all the listeners out there, you if you've heard this, you're you're definitely not alone. Definitely not alone. But yes, there is help. Yes, there is hope. No, you do not have to leak and 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 wear liners and pads for the rest of your life. Yes, you can enjoy your time with your kids in the in the trampoline park if that's your fancy. Like there, you know, there are options and 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 people need to be aware of that. Yeah. Because another thing I'll oftentimes will hear is I didn't even know pelvic floor therapy was a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From providers as well. So some things I've heard, um, one person actually came in, she had a third degree tear and she thought there was no help out there. She's like, oh yeah, my OB told me she had a third degree tear and she did mine. So she wasn't even being referred because her, oh. her provider said, oh, you're going to tear. No matter what you're going to tear. I'm like, so, wow. but luckily a friend referred her. Um, I know we're talking about pelvic floor, but I even think about mastitis because I treat that. So many people have been like, oh, just, just wean, go to yeah. formula. There's no point. I'm like, there's so many things that we can address mm -hmm. that might be contributing to recurrent clogged yeah. milk ducts. We can help with that. If that, if that's your goal, we can help with that. Um, and so again, that's something that's common. I, I hear, um, I often tell people in my area, there are three type of providers. There, there's one in the area who will be like, oh, you're pregnant, congrats, go see Amber. There's some who are like, oh, you're pregnant, congrats, oh, but you're leaking, have some pain, go see Amber. And then there are the others are like, oh, you're dragging your leg in the wheelchair, what do you expect? You're pregnant, it'll get better whenever you're no longer pregnant, and they'll never refer out. And unfortunately, for some people, it really depends on who your provider is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Some could be lack of knowledge as far as the provider just doesn't know, because like, to be fair, they don't get a lot in medical school about what we do for pelvic health. They don't. Right? It's just, they no. don't, mm -hmm. which that's a whole nother topic we could have on how we could change that component. Um, so it might not be the provider just purposely not providing you the service that you need. They may not be aware of it. Absolutely. Um, I had a, a patient come in last week and Thank goodness she was being proactive. She had gone to her GYN who said, oh, you have a grade two prolapse. She was like, huh, okay, what do I do about that? Oh, nothing, we'll just wait and see. And she thought, she said, I left the office and kind of her head tilted and was like, why would I wait? Why would I wait to do something about it? Same story at the end of the week, I had another one who said, oh, you know, we're not going to do anything about it. We'll wait until you need surgery, then we'll do something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like the exact opposite of what should happen. It should have been immediately uh, means a referral. So if you're listening and you've gotten the same news, go see a pelvic PT. They absolutely uh, can be helped by, by going to see them. You do not have to wait and right. you do not have to wait until you need surgery because there's all kinds of things that can be done to conservatively treat it. And if you've had surgery and you weren't referred, go to pelvic PT. We would never perform a surgery and not address things that may have contributed to the need for that surgery to begin with. We can help you not having to have a replacement or, or you know, 
for them to repeat the surgery in a decade or so. Mm-hmm. Go to a pelvic PT if you weren't referred to one and you had surgery. Yeah. Or even things that might arise as a result of the surgery. Because if I see another hysterectomy <laughs> that has not been referred for pelvic PT, I'm going to be like, my God, but they <laughs> see them all the time. And then by the time they come in, they have this pain and they have this issue. And it's like, and they're like, well, I didn't know that all this was going to happen because of a hysterectomy. It can. And the least that, you know, should be done is that you should at least be evaluated so we can make sure that, you know, everything is okay. Yeah. So this brings up a really important, <clears throat> this brings, brings up a really important point, which is you've heard as listeners, you've heard many of the reasons why you do need to see pelvic PT, preconception pelvic PT, prenatal pelvic PT. You don't need to have an active problem because half of what we do at least is about prevention. And then that cuts down on the need for you to see us later or for as longer. Postpartum, obviously 100% of people should be referred. Um, any leakage, any, any prolapse, any heaviness, um, any kind of abdominal surgery at all. Um, you need to come and uh, see a pelvic PT. But now let's talk about the special nature of what combining pelvic PT and a doula is all about, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. that just like up levels everything that we're talking about. So what, I mean, I've heard your stories about that, that combination, but talk just a little bit about how unique that makes you guys in terms of what you're able to offer. I will just start off by saying as, physical therapists, we are nerds, which is a good thing. We (laughs) love to provide so much information, but we provide information overload when we do birth (laughs) prep because we're like, oh, but then do this. And then maybe this, and you have this option and then you have this. But in that moment, people are like, I was given so many options. I don't know what to do. And as pelvic PTs who are also doulas, We have the privilege of understanding like, oh, when we hear these words, we know which stage of labor we're in. We know what positioning we could get people in. Uh, When we know the actual how labor progresses, we're like, we can be there when people become nervous. Like, oh, remember belly breathe. I also talk about the elevator where where no one else knows what we're talking about. Like, go to your basement, you're good. Talk about your pelvic floor. But we're able to be calm because we have that knowledge. And I say this too, because for those who don't know, the doulas, being a doula is unregulated. Technically, you don't have to go through a training to be a doula. That's not saying anything bad, but that's just saying there are people who go through extra training versus not. So we went through extra training and we have the knowledge about the human body as our in our profession as physical therapists. And so we have a different kind of understanding of how we can support people without overwhelm. Um, so if you're a PT out there who happens to be listening, I do think it's a big, it, it does... You provide better service if you fully understand labor, which that often is not discussed in our PT programs. So (laughs) fully understanding that I think can help remove the system, the the education or information overload that we sometimes give our patients, which can just lead to increased stress in that moment of need. Um, So I think with with being combining that, it really makes us more uh, efficient with it. Jay, what do you say? I, I, I agree with that. And I also wanted to add that as a clinician, we, especially as pelvic PTs, we understand a lot. We understand the musculoskeletal system quite well. A lot of the times your OB may be very unaware that you had a history prior to pregnancy. You might've had back pain. You might've had lupus. You might've switched OB. So this might not even have been the OB you saw with a previous pregnancy, right? Then, you know, most people are going to make the assumption all on their own. Well, I'm pregnant. So those things don't have any bearing on this. So oftentimes things are not disclosed. So your patient has a history. And a lot of the times those things, whether medical or uh, musculoskeletal, can influence and impact not only your pregnancy, but your delivery. So as clinicians, we understand that and we understand how to manage those things along with the things that, you know, would be normally progressing during labor. As a doula, you are very well versed in the biopsychosocial to the extent of especially the psychosocial part. 
you understand people, you understand how to read a room, which unfortunately a lot of clinicians don't apparently know how to. You understand how to read a room. You understand when things are necessary. So it's not enough to just have the knowledge, but because you are, you are very versed in the process, in the flow, in the things that can halt labor, in the things that would, you know, encourage it to continue because you're very well versed in that you understand the time and the place for things but you also are an advocate I tell people all the time you cannot be a doula if you do not want to advocate for people you cannot be a doula if you cannot get into a delivery room and stand up for the person or the family that you are serving and it's not about being contentious. It's not about picking a fight. It's not a it's not a we against the system type of thing. It is a your job in that moment is to serve that individual or that family. That is that's one thing. What you got one job, <laughs> and so you go in there with everything that you have. You go in there to ensure that that process is as smooth as possible because we can only control so much at the end of the day. But you go in there making sure that all the controllables are accounted for. And that's so now if we can merge those two things, that clinical hat and just that that true psychosocial and advocacy aspect, you are you are a diamond. I often, if we give example, I think about for advocacy, because I know some people are like, I'm not going to go and say, stop everything right now. Listen to me. Something as simple, and I put those again in quotes, as me sometimes asking my patients, this is immediately postpartum, fourth stage of labor, like placenta has not been you know, detached yet. Um, I could see, oh, they're looking to see if there's any, any tears. And I might see them getting ready for the stitches. I might ask my client, did you? did you want stitches? And then I'll remind them because we had that conversation ahead of time where they're like, oh, what degree tear did I have? Like they know to ask these questions. And then it, maybe it's the first degree. They're like, do I need stitches? Hmm. Well, no, we just thought you might want to. Oh, well then I don't, right? I advocated because I just simply, they're, in, you know, they're happy. They're holding the little one. I'm still watching what's going on with my client. And I simply asked, did you want stitches? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, or I see a big one that people talk about. This is not for like to cause a debate or anything, but often I hear people talk about epidurals and Pitocin. Again, with us understanding if and when is medically necessary for certain things, we're able to provide our clients with the support because they hear all the time, again, social media have a love-hate relationship with it but the things that go viral people being able to go on like I had an unmedicated vaginal birth it's a badge of honor and that is great I've supported many people unmedicated and I've supported many people with an epidural mm -hmm. with no tears right because we practice ahead of time but there are times when I'm like we need to be able to support you and if this is what your body needs because you're tired and you still need to push maybe you know um and then even Pitocin, granted, we try to avoid inductions, but sometimes there's a medical reason. And I don't want us scaring people thinking if you have a Pitocin, uh, if you get Pitocin, right. you're going to have a C-section. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. And that's mm -hmm. why we can, again, combine those two clinical reasoning and having, being able to advocate with and for our patients is going to be a key part. Yeah. I think and, in the hospitals too, just real quick, it, you know, it's kind of like when you go into a doctor's office, they only got so much time, right? They're working with what they've got. A lot of the times people are being talked at, not talked to. And when you are in the midst of a contraction and your brain is focused on that and somebody what is- What's your pain level? What's yeah, your pain, so, level, what's right your pain level? So <laughs> let's go through, let's make sure we get you admitted. And what's your address again? Meanwhile- Can we do a circle exam? Contract, mm -hmm. You know, contraction. <laughs> all these things and they don't have the bandwidth right? You need somebody that can, can help there. Or when people, are, well, we're going to do this. Well, hold on. Not we're going to do. You need to ask. And you'd ask your client, is that something that you're amenable to? Do you understand what that is? Let me help you understand that. So you are there to clarify. Oh, are. You are there, you know, you're truly supporting this person, not only in the physical, but you're making sure that they are aware of all that's happening. Yeah. And what it comes down to is 
when we step back to the 40,000 foot view, because right when you were describing, you know, the intervention and being right there, as a mom of three, it just, it takes me straight back to being there now. And, and I was prepared, right? But you still feel mm. that overwhelm. And unless you have an advocate, one word comes to mind, it's fear. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. oh, they, they, whatever they say, they must know better than me because they're in here. Well, they must it. not, they wouldn't say this if I don't need it. Correct. Right. You know, and so then the default mode begins to accept any and all intervention, which in itself, we know the more intervention there is, the higher the risk of complication, just going mm -hmm. into a hospital, you have a higher risk of complication mm -hmm. because we're very interventional, you know, in the United States, which we know is not a good thing. Actually, when we need the care, we need the care, but, um, doulas, midwives are very, uh, they're the experts, you know, they are the experts in supporting birth, um, no matter what that birth looks like, um, until it reaches a surgical point. And then of course we have, we have trained surgeons for that. Um, and I think that's and also- I'll definitely say there are some, um, I'll, I'll also say I've worked with some amazing OBs, very mm -hmm. hands-off. I've worked with some who based off hospital policy, of course I won't say where, but hospital policy, <laughs> you can't do a delayed core clamping we're having a talk. Oh, look, the, the time has passed. We can now cut the cord. It's been a while. You know, so there have been some amazing OBs out there as well, yes. but you have to be able to know the right questions to ask mm -hmm. and to see what they're actually, how, like, do they truly support a VBAC? Do they truly support you going as long as you naturally need to go as far as gestation? If you go past 40, what is, what is the hospital policy? What is your physician's policy you know so if you do decide to go with the ob make sure you truly understand which questions to ask to see if they'll be able to support the birth you're desiring absolutely and i know there um you guys may have very specific resources on that i wrote a few blogs years ago when i was teaching birth prep classes um through continuing ed providers two pts a long time ago on how to interview both your provider and your hospital. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, you know, we're all like on board with mm -hmm. that. You actually have to ask those. They're not that difficult questions, but they are hard enough that if the answer you get back isn't the one that, you know, is, is open to listening mm -hmm. to you as a person, that's your easy red flag. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, maybe, maybe that provider's not for me or maybe that facility, you know, is not for me. So that's a really important take home point is to make sure that you're interviewing your hospital, interview your provider, um, so that if whatever kind of birth you're seeking will be well supported. And, and Dulis can help with that. <laughs> yeah, I think really quick, just to plug a lot of hospitals, a lot of hospitals within the US have been have closed down in recent years. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that's happening is a lot of hospitals are closing their maternity wards or Alabama. apartments. And that's going to prevent an even larger problem. And, and it's one, not one that the powers that be are talking about. It's it's, at, it's being talked about at the grassroots and community level by the doulas and the midwives. And, and you know those people who are boots on the ground and seeing what's going on. But we're not talking about how this is going to affect birth on a larger scale where we have you know, the the remaining hospitals in metropolitan areas now are overloaded, right? We, are, we already have a nursing shortage. So there's that. We already have a situation where persons might be in labor, but the L&D department may be completely full. So now they're in a waiting room. You've got people in triage and waiting rooms, very uncomfortable, no sort of care, proper care, all of these different things. And how there's still a lot of states there are only 31 states in the U.S. currently that um, have legalized home birth. And even though we know for, you know, um, you know, non high risk pregnancies that this is a very safe option, there's not a lot of there's still some states that are dragging. And all these things are contributing to that overall maternal mortality problem that we have. So, you know, those are things that need to be need to be mentioned out there and talked about more um, within our communities and, and, and within the advocacy spaces. Yeah, it helps us be aware. In general, those of us operating in the birth space, which includes people who are pregnant, you're in that birth space too. You're in the space there, yeah. To just 
be aware of reaching out and looking at what your facility options are. For example, in our area, we had a birth center that couldn't make it and had to close down. The one in the next town over in Chapel Hill, the same thing had you know happened there. And there are all kinds of issues that swirl around that. We could do a part two on policy and advocacy. We might need to, because there's might need so to. much. <laughs> I think we should actually, um, because that is what will change things so that when you're out there looking for a hospital and a provider that you don't bump up against the, these realities that we're talking about. So we will have to do that. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so gosh, because we could do part two right now, because we could just keep going. But I want to give you guys the chance to kind of wrap up, you know, kind of into a, a, a little nutshell. Um, you know, what you feel like working together as PT doulas um, is, is giving you for a, a vision and a mission. Like, I'd love to hear that in a nutshell. I'd love to, I know we talked about um, the, the importance of, you know, embracing things that we might not, you know, be completely comfortable discussing or embracing the not knowing, you know, of, realizing we don't all know everything at all points in time and that it's important to reach out to your to your village and and to create that community um so that's kind of a two-part thing and um and then i've got one more question left but we'll start with that mission vision and um you know us all being comfortable with um the not knowing mm -hmm. i think as i think you know um for us forming the pelvic PT doulas, we know we can't do it alone, right? I'm one person, Amber is one person, we're in different states and we see the landscape of maternal health care, pelvic health care, all the things. And so for us, our vision was to start creating more pelvic PT doulas, start creating individuals who can get out there in their communities and make a difference. Because as one person, we can only do so much. But when we band together with others, if we can spread that message far and wide and have other people now continuing to do that work, now we can reach more people, we can touch more lives. And that's really what it's about. Like, how do we get more people the help they need? How do we impact communities and births and make a difference? And so for us, um, that was huge. And we're building our village, right? So we have had people where they are the only PT and now the only PT who's also a birth doula within um, like 120 miles, right? So they're the, the lone person. And they're like, we don't, I don't have any mentorship. We have a village. We have the support. We speak the same language. We know how to be able to help everyone really. Um, and so just like Jay said, we're growing and we want more people involved. And just because... As we mentioned before, we have a training. We've had people go through the training who aren't actively at first, but they understand that they could be backups. They understand that they could still have that support. Uh, and so we talk about that in the course about how we can incorporate it. And we want people to, as I mentioned at the beginning, not burn out. <laughs> we help people not burn out within this field so that they can have that longevity and provide more support for people in longer time. Yeah. So education, mentorship, um, you know, all the support that you would need as a doula in this space, as a clinician in this space, you know, business support, how, how do I grow? Because at the end of the day too, people still got to eat. <laughs> so how you do I, how do I, how do I make this happen? Right. And so we, we focus on all of those things as a complete package to making sure that, you know, you're not just going to peter out as you get out there into, into the, the, feel the communities to do work that you can thrive um, and be existing for a long time. Yeah. And for our listeners who may be, um, you know, coming to understand the value of both pelvic PT and doulas, there is another option, of course, and that is searching for pelvic PTs who are trained as doulas, because mm -hmm. I think that's an incredible, powerful combination. Um, that was always, that was really something that I was passionate about when, you know, when my kids were little, but it was also, my kids were little, there's a lot to do, you know? Um, so I'm just really glad to see you guys, you know, having taken such an amazing concept 
that has existed in the hearts of lots of us that are either mothers or pelvic PTs in general, or we love someone who's a mom, and you just want to see moms better supported um, and women giving birth better supported. So just thank you for doing the work you're doing. Thank you for the mission that you have. And um, the last question I actually had was, well, it's two. One's fun and one is more serious. The more serious one is please tell um, our listeners where they can find you. Um, maybe Instagram and your website would be fantastic or any other resources you have. And then I have one last fun question. Website, thepelvicptdoulas.org. Instagram, pelvicptdoulas. Um, and you can always email us at info at the pelvicptdoulas.org um, for any information that you want with regards to upcoming courses, mentorship, anything of the sort. And do you guys have um, like a registry there of people who have been through the training to help find people? We're compiling it. So by the end of this year, we'll be able, because we've been doing this for a couple of years now. So we have a good number of people throughout the U.S. Um, so we'll, we'll have it by end of year. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and we'll have those links for you guys, for the listeners in the show notes. And my final question is, um, what book are you reading? That's just totally for fun. Or maybe a new album that you're listening to that's, that's for fun. Yeah. Hmm. Book that I'm reading. I was read. I'm currently reading a book called Living with Intensity, which I find reading fun. It's it's maybe not as fun, but it's about you know parenting gifted children, and I've got two who are completely different personalities, so it's interesting. Uh, but I just did an audio book called um, Saving Nora. It had a thousand and seventy five chapters. But it was, it took me four weeks to get through, but God, it was amazing. Yeah. So. Thank you. All right, Amber, what about you? I'm not currently reading because I'm working on my PhD oh, and my sorry. reading it from my articles. <laughs> <laughs> so those are fun. Um, <laughs> I do enjoy reading, but just not this moment. Um, it varies. It depends on my mood as far as music goes. Um, I am a neo soul kind of person. Um, so I listen to songs even back in the 90s, I, depending on your age, if you're listening, I know that sounds like forever and a day, but those are my <laughs> childhood songs, you know, 90s, early 2000s, um, just, it, 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 so that's really what I'm stuck with right now, remembering my childhood. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Jay, for being on today. And uh, I can't wait for people to find you guys and learn more. Yes. Thank awesome. you. Thanks for having us.